<laughs> Director, Global and Digital Marketing of K2, Mr. Doug Pullman. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. So, as Andrew pointed out, you know, this is my journey of the last, you know, 12 months. It's been an interesting journey. It's been one that has been riddled with errors, challenges, refocusing, moving on some people, bringing some new people in. To really look at K2's marketing, when I first started, you know, our CEO at the time looked at me and said, okay, so where do we fit? You know, and put our marketing organization on a scale of one to 10. I had to look at him and said it was a negative four. Luckily, you know, in December, he asked me the same question. He said, where's our marketing organization now? I said, well, we've now got to a par level. We've now got back to zero. We've now got a platform that we can build on. So what I'm going to do is sh share with you today, you know, just some stories, some things we've done, but they all have the same four common themes. The first one is by doing the simple things well, you will succeed. You will get results and you will build on Second thing is build a foundation. The whole terminology of, you know, crawl, walk, run. You know, I've been on the consulting side and everyone just wants to run. They want to skip, crawl, and walk. And, you know, I personally hate that saying, but it is true. You've got to build in that foundation so that you can keep on adapting, keep on building it upon it, keep on building complexity within campaigns, within your website, with whatever you do. Next one is data, data is critical. If you don't have data, use data or understand data. In your marketing today, you might as well, to be honest, give up. And the third one is don't overcomplicate things. A lot of clients previously, and this is what you'll hear this about K2, is we always try to overcomplicate things. We always made it way more difficult on ourselves we always look for the next best thing, the next piece of technology that was going to save us, next piece of technology that was going to drive revenue, the next major campaign that we were just going to put everything in because we overcomplicated things. We didn't make it simple enough. The story actually goes back two months prior to actually starting. So this is now th you know, 14 months ago. We've all been in the stage of career. A recruiter calls you and says, hey, I'm looking really excited, this is a great opportunity, really excited, you're going to do great, blah, 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 and really building it up. The recruiter who called me did none of that. She called me and said, this is going to be the biggest challenge of your life. The previous marketing department and the previous new chief revenue officer really did some damage to the company that we now need to put a new leadership in place to fix. And when a recruiter kind of says, you know, doesn't build it up too much, you know there's probably going to be some red flags. Unfortunately, I did not focus on that. The next thing that happened was a former colleague called who had just started working there, and she said, we had just gone month to month for marketing budget approvals. And if that doesn't seem to shiver up your spine, then, yeah, you guys have got more balls than I have. Because when you're going month to month, you know, you can't scale anything, you can't plan anything, you can't execute anything, and it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Well, in fact, not quite. I'm going to get into some of the more ridiculous things I've ever heard of later on. And at that point there, I was going to, this is not for me. This is not a job I want. And I'm relaying this into a conversation to a former colleague over Skype, and she was like, what's the worst that could happen? And I was like, well... I could meet the CEO, he could be charismatic, he could sell me on the vision of the company. And that's exactly what he did. So the recruiter called back and was like, okay, let's go and meet, you know, we want you to meet with the CEO later on this week. So turn up, I am in jeans and a t-shirt. You know, wasn't even a button up, it was a straight t-shirt because that was the mindset I'm in. I'm gonna just go and talk to them, you know, maybe give them some free consulting, you know, during the process and you know, we'll talk to them. And met the CEO, nice guy, South African, where the company was based. You know, we got along, you know, we have a rugby connection, been from New Zealand and everything. So we, would, we got along. And he's talking about the company and he's doing his, you know, rah-rah pitch. The company's really going places, blah, 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 blah. 
just as you'd expect. About 30, 45 minutes in, he looks at me and says, you don't buy any of this. And I was like, no. Todd relayed the story, you know, about, you know, month and month marketing budgets. And I was like, well, I also managed to look at the press from 2016. I also managed to read the glass door reviews. And he looked at me, and excuse the language here, this is a quote, he's just like, I fucked up. And what he meant by that is he hired the wrong person. He hired the wrong person to be the chief revenue officer, and he did not course correct fast enough. After that moment, we started talking about the challenges the company faced, what happened back in 2016, what processes they had put in place to ensure that doesn't happen again, and what he personally learned. Gone was an ego of a CEO, founder of a, you know, you know, a $400 million company. Ego went completely out the door. And we started to strategize about how we go and fix this. And it was never, you know, you go fix it. Because he was like, well, it was my mess. I got us into this place in the first place. So we started talking about that, and that ego went out the door. So that's when I accepted. The next part of the story was, you know, three weeks in, we're going through and preparing for our QBR. The web team reported to me at the time, and started going through, you know, standard indicator, web metrics, sessions, visits, you know, all that type of good stuff. And he said to me, well, we've had a quarter of recorded decline, you know. It was a small decline, but everyone was like making excuses as to why it happened. Oh, this happened. This campaign didn't get launched. Oh, we put that on hold. Um, you know, they did something in 2016 when product, the product marketing team was in charge of the website and they redeveloped it and didn't follow any best practices. So they killed our SEO and we're still trying to get our way out of that. Me being me was like, okay, that's fine, but what about year over year? Like, you just started talking about 2016, we're now in 2017, so where were we? What type of impact has this had? And I got the good old, let me look into that for you. Now, we use Google Analytics, so it's not hard to get information on Google Analytics, right? So I made him pull it up on the screen. We're screen sharing, he's like, hey, just, just pull it up. 38% decline year over year, 17% decline quarter over quarter, and a consistent week over week decline. If you were actually looking at the analytics, if you were looking at just even purely the indicative, metri indicative data, you would have been able to tell that something was going on, and that, it, that more importantly, that it's sustained. So, at that point there, I was like, okay, one, we as an organization now be, be more transparent in our data about how we go about approaching things. So I started to put into place, you know, operational reports. Standard Monday morning reports that everyone delivered. Now, as Lance just said, you know, we should be focusing on bottom of the funnel metrics. You know, we've got other reports to do that and basically leadership. But I needed these people that were in charge of their platforms, whether it was the web, whether it was AdWords, whether it was um, within our marketing automation system, or whether it was our SEO tool. I need them looking at the reporting and looking at all those metrics. Because one, if they're not looking at the metrics, they don't understand cause and effect. They don't understand if we release a campaign, if we do this action, does it gonna have a positive impact? They can't tell. So we did five week rolling reports. They were mandated to do it every Monday morning before a Monday morning team meeting at 10.30. Across Google Analytics, our social metrics, Salesforce campaign data, and our SEO tools. Looking at where we were ranking, what changes have we made, and then we'd use that data to make hypotheses moving forward or look to review. Something really simple, but within three weeks, they could start to identify areas of concern. They could start to identify, okay, we are gonna have a 4% traffic drop because we've stopped XYZ paid campaign for whatever reason. Or, hey, we don't have an email campaign going out this week, so it's actually gonna be a 7% decrease. Or more importantly, if we run XYZ campaign, we're gonna get a whatever increase in traffic. And then at that point there, they understand those conversion metrics, they can back into, and they can start forecasting revenue. 
Another area that around Dada that they, I felt like they were hiding. I felt like no one could give me what our email click-through stats were. And everyone's looking at this slide going, really? 0.4, 0.5%, what on earth were you guys doing? To be honest, I don't know. When we looked at this, I was going through old QBRs, and they launched a whole lot of series of campaigns, and they spent a lot of time building these campaigns across six industry verticals and you know, a sea level campaign. We're going through previous QBRs, and I looked at those, and the first one I came up to, they launched, and they said, hey, we launched all these campaigns, so the click-through rate is 0.4%. Got me thinking, what? who in their right mind would think 0.4% is a good click-through rate? You know, unless you're dealing with display. And I was like, what's going on? So next QBR looked at that one. It's updated stats on that. They were excited. You can tell in the way they had written it, the way they had proposed it, and the graphics they were using, that they were excited that they improved it from 0.4 to 0.5. And I read this and thought, who in their right mind considers that a good performance? You know, typically, I'm looking at 2% minimum, 3% best practice, and, you know, somewhere in about 3.25% for the technology industry that we're in as being a good standard. And they were championing this, and they were excited by it, and it's one area that I had to get them back to look at what our competitors are doing, look at what we have from a benchmarking standard, you know. We've got serious decisions information. We can benchmark on that. You know, Silverpop every couple of years puts out a really, you know, by IBM puts out a really good benchmarking survey that breaks it down by industry. You know, you've got Aloqua and Marketo, they do their own benchmark surveys and things like that, but they don't normally break it down by industry. Then started looking a little bit more into the campaigns. You know, we're now about a month and a half in, started looking at the campaigns and started finding weird things. So this is Form Your State of a Nurture Series. Now there were seven campaigns like this, like I mentioned, six industry campaigns, one C-level campaigns. The only difference across them was that there was some very subtle text changes. Wasn't even in the subject line. So you're not gonna have a boost of opening rates between the emails. They should actually be pretty static. And then the other thing was, is that every 10 days they got an email. There was no acceleration through the sales funnel. There was no acceleration based on their engagement. It was just every 10 days you got an email. <laughs> it gets worse than that. After the 60 days, nothing. Literally, they dropped off the face of the planet. Really, they could get picked up by our field marketing team potentially and maybe if they hadn't gone out and sourced their own data, which they were doing at the time, or if they weren't um, based in a certain geographic area, they couldn't have got picked up. We went through a period of time that over 50% of our database had not, been, um, had not been contacted, you know, via any, any outgoing metric and beyond and stuff like that. So, same time, two months in. Get a call from people over at Captora, you know, which was our um, you know, SEO company and helping us you know, do some hosting and things like that. Got a call from them saying, hey guys, sorry, funding's run out, we need to shut down. I was like, okay, what are we gonna do? We needed to go about finding a new replacement for them and they introduced us to Bright Edge. And Bright Edge is a fantastic tool, lots of bells and whistles and things like that. So we needed to go about figuring out how we go about operationalizing the migration from Captura to Bright Edge. And how do we go about doing it with the resources that we had? So we had 330 pages in Captura that we needed to migrate. You know, and of which you know, revolved around roughly about 2,500 you know, plus keywords across our space. Keeping it simple, we could have undertaken a large project and you know, migrated all 330 pages at one time. We decided we'd do it in chunks. But more importantly, Captura's methodology on you know, SEO specifically was around short form content wins every single time. Now, you know, if you're big into SEO, you know that's not true. 
just like mix of content through the buyer's journey, you've got to have a mix of content, content types through SEO. So operationalizing that, we said, OK, get a contact, contract writer in South Africa who had been working with us um, in the past. And we could have undertaken you know, a three-month project and updated all 330 pages to go from 400 words to 1,200 words, as, as well as um, increasing the reading level of those pages. Decided we need to keep this thing going. And I can't tie up resources and funds for that entire you know, three, four-month period. So what I did, operationalizing it, I said, hey, we're just going to do five per week. You know, and if you do your math, it's like 40 and a half weeks. So it's a year-long project. Apart from my team can handle the approvals, go through the approvals, go through all the backlinking, and handle five pages. She can handle five pages, roughly, you know, five hours a week. So we're not, you know, overtaxing any one team so they can still do other things. And by doing five pages per week, it's a lot easier to track and then manage. So when that 60-day mark hits, where Google really starts kicking in, we can actually start to see significant results. And you can see just by doing that, the results that we've had. This is just page one you know, search growth since March, you know, since May of last year. Significant growth week over week, month over month. There's a couple of small dips in there, which is what you would expect, but by monthly, you know, that's what we expect. And we actually saw a large uptick in um, May and June of 2018. The other thing we had to do was talking to them about the buyer's journey. Started talking to the team about the buyer's journey, especially my team and how it relates to the web and how we go about looking at display advertising and personas and things like that. And basically, a lot of blank looks. So I decided to simplify that. How do we take just normal, you know, five stages of the buyer's journey, how do we shrink it down? And we did what most people do. We just dropped it into three stages. Awareness, consideration, and decision-based content. At the same time, as we're doing this migration from Captura to Bright Edge, I'm also looking at the content that we created. And we had gone through several large chunks of creating content. Pretty much every person before me that was in my role came in and said, hey, we need more content. We need to refresh our content. And we were very much of a me, 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 me type company. We never focused on the awareness-based content or what we did focus on awareness. It talked about K2 and the product and how product can solve your solution. We didn't talk about how the process automation, which is a space that we're in, how that can solve your problem. We were definitely a product-first company, and we had to change that. So we started, so we started to build out the starting mapping the content to each one of the buyer's journeys. And we still do that today. Every type of content, every type of campaign we launch has to have content all the way through the buyer's journey. Awareness, focusing on top of the funnel based, um, thought leadership, machine learning, artificial intelligence, things like that, all the sexy keywords that we can use to actually bring people in to show that we're advancing the technology and then focus on what the problems are um, that they have in their space. Then consideration-based content, really diving into what our product can do, how we can help you. When you're considering process automation, how can we help that, um, how, how we can help you solve those problems? And then decision-based content, simple things like ROI calculator, pricing, a little bit more technical information around integration that IT teams and things are going to need. So we're now getting through this, and we're now going through, and we're finding all these little things. And then finally, in, you know, it was November, we decided, hey, our marketing operations team currently reported sales up, so let's bring it back under marketing, and let's bring them back into my org. And here's when things got a little bit more interesting. Going through all the marketing technology that we had available to us, and a lot of them I knew, apart from when I started to actually look through the budget numbers, there was a lot there that were either duplicative or not needed. So we had Eloqua on 24, Vidyard, Smartsheet, Go to Webinar, Bright Talk, Link Strategies, you name it, we pretty much had it. At one point, we were spending somewhere between 27 and 35% of marketing spend was directed towards technology. 
we're not John Connor, you know, from Terminator movies. Technology is not there to save us, or is not going to save us. We had to start stripping out all these technologies, all these broken points, all these data connections that were broken, that have been around forever, that haven't been maintained. We had to strip them all the way back. You know, Alec was a good example of that. Our marketing, one of our marketing ops person was spending 50% of her time on break fix because we had had our Alec, for instance, you know, I think almost a decade now, 2008 we started with them. And that integration had not been refreshed, had not been redeveloped, and it would bolt on upon bolt on upon bolt on. So this past January, you know, we just started from scratch. We built a new integration, and through that, that person now spends less than 5% of her time because all those thousands of errors that we were getting for the integration no longer happen. Then at the same time, you know, January comes around, we're launching our new campaign strategy. How do we go about fitting the bias journey that we had talked about earlier? How do we go about lining that in the most simplistic way possible that we can build a journey upon it, or that we can build a foundation upon it? So really simple. First four emails on the left-hand side is all around process automation. Can we position process automation as the hero? So these are the welcome emails, the first touches that someone gets when they download a piece of content through content syndication partners, through online, download a, you know, submitted a form. Those four emails, the first one, is designed to add value immediately. It's kind of like the best piece that we can possibly give you to ensure that you will get value out of a communications. Next one, looks at fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Can we put some fear and some uncertainty in terms of what you're currently doing in process automation? Next one looks at fear of missing out. Let's show what other people are doing. Let's show what other customers in your space are doing. You know, relatively at a high level without going into too much detail as you would in a normal case study. And the last one is really focusing around positioning process automation as a hero. Notice I didn't mention talking about K2, didn't talk about our solution, our product, in any of those emails, apart from the fact that you were getting it and you should be seeing value from it. These were the same emails or the same structure as they were getting the 0.4 to 0.5% click-through rates. The next set to are consideration-based emails, looking at case studies and ROI. How much ROI are you going to get out of process automation using K2? And then the last three, you know, in that decision phase. You know, case studies, showing proof points, proving that we've actually done it, providing them with the demo of the software, whether it's part of the free trial, or whether it's um, an online daily demo. And then the last one, which we worked on sales with, was the top 10 questions sales gets asked. Can we prep them before a sales call that they've got all the information that they need? Sales has said that that piece alone was worth the hour and a half that they had. Because they have come back and said, we have saved so much time on those introductory phone calls that we, they already know it. The first four emails, you know, we talked about 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, and now getting 2.45%. Once again, it's simple, but it's a foundation that we can build on. We can start adding more personalization. We can start looking at regionalization. We can then start to pull back in industries because we, now we have a benchmark which is somewhat within what I call decent. The consideration decision-based content, click-through rates of over 90%. In fact, as of this morning, I think it was still hovering about 93%, which is a phenomenal result, but it just shows right content at the right time, which is about the simplest thing we can do, gets results. And once again, A-B testing and multivariate testing now to improve those performance. To ensure that one, we're providing the information, we have a relatively long sales cycle. You know, our sales cycle is about 180 days. So trying to get that to come down by providing them enough information as they go through. Mentioned before, 
that, you know, over 50% of our database had not been contacted within nine months. You know, you can just do the math. You know, 1.4 million people in the database, 750,000 people approximately had not been contacted within nine months. You know, let's just say, a, you know, cost per lead, let's just say 10 bucks, you're doing the math. It's a lot of money to be just throwing away. The other thing we, we had to contend with as well, so I'm going to let the team have a little bit of a pass, was that you know, we also have this just distributed network, you know, which took a lot of time for, people, for my team, especially our creative team, to work with. Because anything we did for them, did for K2 ourselves, we also were required contractually to provide to them. And in previous People's Infinite Wisdoms, we were required to build it out of a box for whatever marketing automation system they were on. So if you've ever used Eloqua and then gone to Marketo and then gone to Padot, you can't take copy and HTML and drop it between them. We actually had to build multiple different versions because that's what it was. We're on Eloqua, Germany was on um, you know, Marketo, and our friends over in Australia were on Padot. And we were required to create the campaigns in their instance for them. It was ridiculous. So wasted data equals wasted money. You know, like I said, it's a huge amount of money that we're just throwing away. The other thing we had to simplify, you know, is our content creation process. I mentioned earlier that, you know, we went through a period of time that we were basically chunking out six-month periods that our creative team and our content writers and our content manager, their whole job was just creating massive amounts of blocks of content. And then we would go another 18 months without creating any new content. And then we would go, ah, oh, it's out of date. We would spend another six months developing all this content. I was like, no, let's operationalize this as best as we can. So top of the funnel content, white papers is about the easiest thing we can do to outsource content because it doesn't really take a huge amount of um, subject matter expertise on the product itself. What it does is you've got to find the right writers and the right team and we were lucky enough to find someone, um, a couple of professors out of Arizona State, U State University who do write a lot on artificial intelligence, machine learning, process automation, and things like that. So we were able to use them. And we're like, okay, we've still got to funnel things through the distributors, unfortunately. So we'll just commission eight white papers throughout the year. So it's roughly one every six weeks. Then what the team internal will do, break it up. You know, at least two secondary assets at the top of funnel stage. So whether it's a podcast, a video, or, well, there's always going to be a blog, um, or if it's a cheat sheet, an infographic, you name it, any type of mix of mediums, they had to come up with just two, just two pieces of additional pieces of content, and that was it. And then another couple of pieces for consideration and decision-based content, where we start to do a deep dive on that campaign's theme. So with Saddle Force Intelligence, talking about how we can use, unfortunately, the horrible name, K2 Bob's, thing to automate um, HR onboarding, to automate PTO requests, which is what part of the system can do. So this working out really well. Once again, simple things, operationalizing and building the foundation so it's repeatable. It takes the team a lot less time to spin up these assets now, and we've got a constant refresh of content. The next bit that we had to look at was our website. It was, well, let's just say awful. Our new CEO arrived in January, and the first thing he said to me was, you're in charge of the website, and I had to say yes. Then I had to say, but, <laughs> and then pointed out all the things that I knew he was going to say. There was nothing about the bite. There was no buyer's journey at all. You could not navigate yourself around. There was really no avenue. It was really not working as a demand general sales tool at all. So. I came up with this term, literally on the spot, you know, being a consultant, I have a tendency to just be able to BS about things. I was like, okay, we're gonna do three stages in three pages. And what I meant was by that is, can I take people through the buyer's journey within three pages of the website? And it really looked kind of like this. Homepage was awareness, you know, top of funnel based content. Can I get them into a little bit deeper? Can I offer them up? you know, a trial or a demo, can I offer up the latest white paper webinar and things like that. Then one page deeper, looking at the product itself and our, what we call our, you know, key eight tenants or key advantages over our competitors, 
you know, we consider that consideration-based content. We consider that content that actually starts to move a little bit deeper into the product. And then after that, looking at decision-based content, pricing, ROI calculator, and more technical in-depth integration documents. I'm just gonna jump through, this is probably the best example. You know, left-hand side, same phase base of content. So this is one of the tenant pages, so kind of call this consideration. Consideration, left-hand side, same phase of the buyer's journey. So they can sp look for more information. Right-hand side was always next stage. And my team kind of got caught up and were like, okay, but we could use that right-hand side to promote our latest webinar, get more people in it. And I was like, well, that fits the purpose. At least try this. Let's at least see, can we get people going through the sales funnel faster? Because that's ultimately what I need them to do. There is ample places to promote new events, to promote new things and use their real estate. But if we keep it simple, we always say that that right-hand side is for next decision-based content then we've got a structure and a foundation that we can build on, we can test, and we can move through. So four key takeaways from today. You've heard me say them all the time. Do the simple things well. Build a foundation you can build on, um, and don't overcomplicate the task. And more importantly, don't let others overcomplicate the task for you. We all have different pressures from different people. The ability to say no in the nicest possible way is going to be your friend. And then the last thing is test and learn. You know, by doing this approach, by simplifying it, you have to do the whole agile marketing thing and you have to keep on developing, keep on learning because you're going to end up standing here and go, well, we did that five years ago. But I'm going, okay, well, we were a year ago. We could have taken five years to get where we were now and then we are gonna be 10 years ahead at the end of this year. By just constantly developing it, and constantly doing better what we did yesterday today is my, what I tell my team. All I care about is we do things better than we did yesterday. It's the simplest approach we can take. So finally, any questions? Okay, any questions? Oh, one of them back, Andrew. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that was close. Um, just curious about when going back to what you were saying about your distributors um, and having to uh, provide them with all the updates and things like that. If you had the blank slate, uh, how would you approach um, integrating your foreign distributors? Um, to, to be honest, I would buy them, um, <laughs> we, which is one area that we, and we're actually looking at because we all understand how much of an issue and how much of a time suck they really are. Um, right now, we, they did used to be on K2.com. We used to have translation and everything like that for our distributors. We could not supply them what they needed. So they went rogue, and if you go to k2europe.net, or we had a completely different entity, if you go to k2 France, a completely different entity, and what was it, k2aus-nz.com for k2 Australia New Zealand, we could not supply it to them. So if I did anything, and you know we're broaching the subject now around k2.com, is bring them back into the fold, is making sure they're part of the discovery, that we're not enforcing things on them, um, same thing with marketing automation. I would love to bring them in and just have them use Eloqua, you know, or Marketo, or something that we can standardize on um, so that we can help them run their campaigns for them and we can provide support. Um, but we let them down in the past. So for me, it's about regaining their trust. Thank you. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Thanks, guys. Oh, just one more. <laughs> Are you ready? You want this? Pretty. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi again, I'm Janie um, from the first panel. 
Um, my question is around, um, you said that it's really hard when all your analytics platforms, especially market analytics platforms, don't talk to each other. And when I went to a Tableau conference in New York City last mm -hmm. month, they said that's the main problem that most of their users have on the paid or the free version. Yep. Um, they have really expert analytics, uh, an analysts and data scientists, but their data doesn't talk to each other, so at the first level. So how do you overcome that? Because that's a big problem in digital marketing. So <laughs> our problem wasn't really in the fact that we could get the analytics into a standard place. You know, coming from Seattle, you know, I know the guys at Tableau pretty well. And, you know, getting the data into one platform was not an issue. It was having people understand the data that they were pulling out and into the platform that I was finding to be the larger issue. Which is why when they said, hey, I need my you know, weekly re operational reports, they automatically went to, how do we streamline this? How do we automate this? And I was like, no. No, I wanted an Excel spreadsheet because I want you to go take the data out and enter in the numbers. Because you obviously didn't understand or use the data previously, and now I need to force you to do it. And that was one of the largest issues. Now that we've had a team cha change and the team's been doing it for a while, we're probably at a place now that we can actually start to look at either using Domo, or Power BI, Tableau, something to visualize that data, to bring it all in, um, because now they actually understand the data. But my problem was I need them to understand it, which I had to take them back to primary school and say, pull the data out, understand it, and use it that way. Does that answer your question? Probably not. Yep. I forced the team to take it out and put it into Excel. Now, if I'm going to be honest with you, and hopefully they don't see the recording, I don't actually look at it. I just need to know that they looked at it and pulled the information out because I do have a visualization. You know, I do pull the current information out into our Power BI, so I actually see that information before they presented it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Doc. Oh, shit.